Uh, I'm Walt Meyer at the National Snow and Ice Data Center, um, and I'll, I'm going to host this um, and introduce our speakers. Um, today we have um, from Spire, um, which is uh, putting up uh, uh, GNS, GNSS uh, satellites and doing uh, some interesting applications with them, um, which I'll talk about specifically for sea ice here today. Um, our first speaker is um, Dallas Masters, um, and he uh, is the director of the Earth's Observations Group at SPIRE. Um, he had his PhD, uh, he got his PhD here at, at the University of Colorado in the Aerospace Engineering Sciences Department, um, and has been uh, working on GNSS uh, technology and, and remote sensing um, uh, since then. And then we also have Jessica Cartwright, who is a science programmer at, at SPIRE. Um, she got her PhD at the uh, National Oceanography Center in the UK. Um, again, looking at reflected navigation signals and has been working uh, particularly in the cryosphere. Um, so I'll, uh, with that, I'll, I'll let the two of you get started. I think Dallas, you're gonna lead it off. So go ahead. Thank you, Walt, I appreciate it. And uh, Jessica is gonna advance the slides um, and hopefully my audio um, will be maintained, but my video doesn't work with Zoom. So I apologize for that. Um, so I'm going to talk today about um, Spire's uh, small satellite constellation, which you might be unfamiliar with, um, but it's sort of a, a new paradigm in remote sensing using uh, a lot of small satellites uh, to, to do remote sensing of Earth observations. And I'm going to talk uh, specifically about a new type of uh, data set that we've been collecting for the last couple of years um, that have some interesting applications towards sea ice, um, as well as ice sheets. Um, and other applications, I think you'll you might find them very interesting. And I'd like to try to drum up some interest in these data. They're now these data are going to flow to the NASA Commercial Satellite Data Acquisition Program, and so they're available to researchers to start using. Um, and there are very few publications on these data, so make a mad scramble to NASA, grab the data, and you can have some really interesting <laughs> potential publications with these data. So I'll first do an introduction of the Spires Nano Satellites. I'll talk about um, the observations that we're uh, mainly focused on today, which are what we call grazing angle GNS GNSSR or GNSS reflectometry observations. And then I'll talk about two of the applications that we are pursuing at SPIRE um, initially from these data sets. One is ice sea ice altimetry, and the other one is sea ice detection classification. Um, they are similar data sets, but they have sort of different processing and different um, applications. And then I'll also talk about some other um, uh, cryospheric applications and uh, new satellites um, to finish off. Um, so just a little bit quick introduction to Spire. Um, it's, we're a commercial small satellite company. We've been in existence for a little over five or six years now. Um, our initial um, Earth observations were very much focused on radio occultation measurements, which make an atmospheric profile measurement, a temperature profile measurement in the atmosphere. Um, radio occultations are um, you know, uh, vertical profile uh, measurements that are then assimilated into uh, numerical weather prediction systems to improve weather forecasting. So they're very important for weather forecasting. And because they use uh, GNSS signals, they also have the ability to be unbiased um, because it's a phase measurement that we're making to do this temperature profile. Um, so they have some really unique characteristics. Um, as some people have said, uh, Rick Anthes at uh, INCAR, they're sort of like the, the world's best thermometer for measuring temperature in the atmosphere because they're unbiased and they're very precise measurements. Um, as you can see, what we've started out doing in 2018 was about 100 profiles a day from a few small satellites. Um, and if you go to the next slide, Jessica, or hit click, um, you should see that we have now, um, back in February of 2020, are on the order of about 10,000 profiles a day. Um, and there's about a 100x increase. And this is because we're using small satellites that can be launched on many different rockets um, very often. And we're now we're over 100 satellites in our constellation. Um, and there are about 40 um, to 50 satellites that can make these types of measurements. As well, we do things very quickly. So if you're familiar with, say, the Cosmic 2 satellites, um, or if you're familiar with Cygnus, um, those types of satellites, you know, are launched and they don't really change the way they operate. We do change the way we operate. And so we have done some things like um, uh, track Galileo and QZSS and other types of signals, not just GPS signals to do these measurements. And that, that 
drastically in increases the amount of data that we collect with these satellites. And again, you'll see these satellites are the size of wine bottles. And so um, they have some pretty unique um, capabilities for such a small satellite. Um, we do a, a number of different observations with these satellites, um, but uh, currently um, the different types of observations that are listed here at the bottom um, are all done with a GNSS science receiver that's flying on these small satellites. Um, you can see it's done, it's doing a radio occultation measurement through the atmosphere that includes ionosphere, the neutral atmosphere, um, and we can uh, do those profile measurements. Um, but, we're, but we also make what we call GNSS reflectometry measurements, which is a uh, reflection of the signals off of the earth surface, whether it's land surface for soil moisture, um, sea ice, or ocean winds. And these GNSS, GNSS signals are L-band measurements. So they're about a 19 centimeter wavelength, which is unique to um, you know, a remote sensing instrument. Um, they're much different than the bandwidths and the um, frequencies that you are familiar with with typical radar altimeters. Um, and so they're, they're operating in a different regime completely. Um, but what we're talking about mostly today are the grazing angle reflections. You can go to the next slide, Jessica. I'm sorry. I'm going to be I'm going to be talking a little bit of today just about the reflectometry and the sea ice applications. Go to, ne go to the next slide. Um, these these satellites um, that we're mainly talking about today for grazing angle are the satellites in the top left of this slide. Um, so Spire does have other versions of these satellites, which I will introduce as well, and they're in the bottom part of that panel. But specifically today, talking about grazing angle, we're talking about these satellites that you see in this top. Um, panel. Um, the satellite's called a 3U bus. It's about this, like I said, it's about the size of a wine bottle. It flies in that vertical orientation. And that white antenna that you can see there is the radio occultation antenna, which we're using as well to pick up these shallow grazing angle reflections. There's an identical antenna on the other side of that spacecraft. Um, so there's two antennas. They fly in a in an, an orientation where the, the reflection is occurring in the in the for direction in the aft direction of the um, of the um, satellite, and um, this satellite carries a, a receiver that can track GPS, Galileo, Globe, and Ascusius as all of the GNSS constellation satellites. Um, the other two satellites that I'm introducing today as well are what we consider to be con conventional GNSSR satellites. They're in the bottom. I'm not going to spend too much time on them, but their antennas are pointed nadir, and they are not dual frequency sat. Uh, uh, receiving satellites, their antennas are single frequency, and that's in a key point. Um, the satellite on the top is a dual frequency satellite, the antenna is dual frequency, which means that we can make a measurement which corrects for the ionosphere, uh, typically like a, a normal radar altimeter would do, but the bottom two satellites um, are not doing that. And so therefore they do have applications of sea ice, but they are uh, not doing dual frequency measurements. Um, a little bit about the way we fly these satellites. They're in multiple different orbit planes. So if I were to show you a, a map or a visualization, um, which I wish I could have done, um, you would see satellites flying all around the earth in different orbit planes. And, in, and in, as well, many satellites within um, the same orbit plane, which is a bit, something very interesting um, that I hope to be able to show you too later on in this presentation is the fact that these satellites are following each other and they make measurements of the exact same surface um, independently among different satellites. But you can see that there are many satellites in sun synchronous orbits. And there's about 32 uh, radio occultation satellites, those that are making grazing angle observations. I think that's actually, that number should be updated. It's even more than that. And then there are also two of these um, conventional satellites, which is in the bottom picture, um, also flying in a polar orbit. You can just keep going. Um, so what is GNSS reflectometry? This is when our satellite, which is pictured in the middle of this cartoon, it's the Spire LEO receiver. It's when it's picking up both a direct signal um, from the GNSS satellites. And GNSS means GPS, GONASS, Galileo, all of the different countries are flying these constellations of um, you know, 20 plus satellites that uh, broadcast these L-band signals all the time. Um, and then we also pick up a reflected signal at our spacecraft. And so there's two paths. Um, the signals um, that are reflecting off the surface are sensitive to both the surface roughness and the dielectric properties of the, that surface. Um, if it's a smooth surface, say like very first year, like new first year ice, the signal will be coherent and it will look like a direct signal um, for all intents and purposes, but at a longer path length. 
And then if we can compare the phase measurements of these two signals, we can make an altimeter measurement. Um, that's the interesting um, altimetry measurement, as well as the, um, the, the surface roughness can be measured as well through the phase noise itself and as well as the, the um, signal to noise ratio, the reflectivity of the surface. And so that's kind of what's shown here. And on the right hand side, you know, the idea is just simply to show you that this is a different measurement than a typical radar altimeter. Um, a radar altimeter is the same, it's a bi-static radar, it just happens to be in a near, in a nadir incidence. And so it's, it's um, two paths are exactly the same, you know, um, down and back to the satellite. And so what you see here is just a different ge geometry. Next satellite, or next um, slide, please. So what are the benefits of GNSSR? Well, number one, it's inexpensive because we're not carrying a transmitter. We're using a signal that's already being broadcast by other satellites. That signal is ubiquitous. It's everywhere, right? Your, your cell phone is picking up multiple GNSS transmissions all the time. Our satellites are doing the same thing, and they're doing it for all the constellations, and they're picking up the reflections as well. Um, so our satellites can be low power and low mass um, and by using these signals. When the reflections happening from the surface are coherent, this, this actual physical um, uh, sampling size, uh, you know, spatial sampling size is very small. It's on the order of about one kilometer uh, or to six kilometers a long track, depending on how long we average the data. And it's about half a kilometer across track. Um, and that's because it's a coherent reflection and it looks like it's just basically the first Fresnel zone um, um, projected onto the surface. So it's very small. Um, it lends itself to constellations of missions and the constellations of satellites like we're doing. Um, and it potentially can help us do better monitoring of the cryosphere um, by filling in gaps with traditional systems. And so that's what we're gonna be showing you today. So um, some of the applications of the cryosphere that we'll be talking about today are the sea ice detection, the, the ice altimetry, um, ice classification, and as well, some interesting, um, I would say preliminary um, views of some data that show some, so show some sensitivity to the marginal ice zone. And Jessica will be talking about that as well. Now, I will also say that we're focusing today on sea ice. We have also turned on this measurement over the ice sheets and the ice sheets also do reflect these signals. And I will show a very quick um, map that shows some of those coherent reflections over the ice sheets. So if you're interested in ice reflections over the sh ice sheets, we also have the ability to look at that, and especially, especially to map uh, uh, surface water melt on the ice sheets, as well as potentially al the altimetry of the ice sheet itself. So that's something that, that we're not really going to talk about today, but it's, it's within these data sets and it's something that you might be interested in. So next um, slide, Jessica. So I'll, I'll start by the, I, the altimetry application and then Jessica will um, transition to the classification al um, um, application. So first, a quick um, uh, introduction to the grazing angle technique. So again, we have this um, reflection that's happening at the earth surface for altimetry. Um, we have what we expect to be the, um, the path length um, based upon um, what we know about where the ocean surface is and the geoid. And then we have what we measure. And what we're looking for is potentially the residual between those. Now, these measurements are happening at very low elevation angles. We call them grazing angles. Um, we are programming our satellites to do this um, in the five to 30 degree elevation range. Now we can program the satellite to start at zero and go up to say 30 degrees. But the reason we don't do that is a couple of reasons. Um, when you go really shallow, you, you're traversing a huge amount of the troposphere and the troposphere has a delay term in it, which will cause uh, the potential of this altimeter measurement to really have a, a large error term. So at five degrees, it, this, this is still somewhat manageable, but I'll show you as well that the tropospheric error term does come into effect. Um, but these paths, both the direct signal path and the reflected signal paths do carry error terms in them, which are common. And so if we're using the difference between the direct signal path and the reflected signal path, we can cancel out those error those terms and that becomes um, a way to remove those from, from the um, altimeter measurement. I would also say that we were initially funded by NOAA technology um, that should be TMP, maturation program, technology maturation program, to do this work for uh, sea, sea surfaces, not just sea ice surfaces, but totally sea surface, like sea surface altimetry. But what we found is that the mo most places, um, our, the ocean surface is very rough and we don't get a coherent reflection um, that we're trying, that we can measure. So we are concentrating on sea ice these days. 
Um, so again, the target measurement is this sort of um, uh, uh, incremental um, path delay with respect to what we think the, the reflecting surface is. And so we're measuring this delta. So this measurement makes a very good relative height profile measurement along the track of the, of the, of the satellite or where this reflection is happening. Um, one of the things that I'll show you is that we still have a problem of estimating the absolute bias. So if we wanted to compare these data to a, another truth data set, like a mean sea surface model, which I'll show you, or ISAT2 or CRISAT2, what, we'll, what we would find is that we would have to remove this bias term and then the relative height along the track should match those other data sets very well. And I'll show you that. And again, these are all of the error terms that I, we talked about. Some of them are common in these two paths. So the transmitter orbit position and the transmitter clock errors are going to be common on the direct signal and the reflected signal. Um, the ionosphere is not um, because the ionosphere is going through uh, both. Uh, it basically has a different path that we're measuring it um, in. And then as well, the atmospheric delay term, the tropospheric delay term, which is the largest error term, is um, one that we have to estimate from either a model or from some other observation um, of the tropospheric delay um, when we're making these. The receiver clock and the receiver orbits are well as well common terms with the two paths, and so they can cancel out. And what we're measuring is basically this delta height term um, that you see at the bottom. Um, but you can see that there are still some, some error sources that we have to, to mitigate um, in these measurements. So here are some of the results from making these measurements. This is like some of the very first results. Um, this is a sea ice altimetry result. It's over the Sea of Akash. And what these um, results show on the right-hand side is that's a track of the satellite. You can see the beginning of the track and the end of the, the, end of the track of the reflection. I I'm sorry, I said satellite, it's the reflection point. Um, you can see that the elevation angle plotted in the top right is starting out at about 16 degrees and it goes downward from there. And so we're, we're getting shallower and shallower with this particular um, reflection. It's about, eight, it's about um, 150 seconds long, um, but the, um, uh, the around 80 seconds into the measurement, you can see in the middle uh, left plot, and the middle left plot's showing you the signal to noise ratio of the two different frequencies that we're measuring. And this is the reflection. And what you can see is there's an abrupt change. And that's when we go from sea ice to open ocean water. Now, how do I know it's sea ice on the left and open ocean on the right? Well, I look at the spectrogram, which is on the middle right plot, and it shows you that it's a coherent signal where, where there's a very strong um, coherent signal in the middle of that spectrogram. And then as you see on the right hand side, it it loses coherence abruptly. Um, you can still see some coherence, and that's because the surface is um, still smooth enough. Um, and then it and then it gets probably too rough because it's going over wind roughened seas. The bottom left plot is a is basically our estimate of the height profile along the reflection track. And you can see that this is a height profile that changes about two meters along this track, from about 17 to a little over 19 um, meters. And so the, um, our, our data is in blue and it's at 50 Hertz observations. So it's, it's a lot of data that's being sampled. Technically those are sub kilometer resolution type of data, um, each, each particular data point. And then in orange is the model sea surface um, um, DTU 10 or DTU 18, sorry, that's been corrected by the TPX09 tides. So what you see is that our data follow exactly the tide corrected mean sea surface. Now, if you look at the residuals for this particular track, you can look at, you can see that the residuals are very low and these are, you know, less than three centimeters um, with respect to that mean sea surface. And what we've tried to understand here is if we were, if we understood the, the sea ice thickness, would we, would we see the thickness of the ice in the residuals um, between our estimate of the height and a mean sea surface model? And what we see is that we don't really have, see that much correlation between our measurements and SNAP, but this is just one particular track that we were looking at. Um, we also did some initial estimation of what we think the reflection surface is, and we think it's this air-snow interface, and that's due to some modeling we've done, but that is still an open question, and we don't know exactly the interface that we're reflecting from. So this is a, still an open question. 
Um, this is also some examples of the altimetry measurements in different locations. Um, these are in the southern uh, hemisphere around Antarctica. And again, these measurements show, and you can see here as well, that the, not all of the measurement is coherent. So the top right plot, or the top two plots, the map and the elevation angle, they show you that where we have a, a measurement in um, orange, the um, is where it's coherent. It's not coherent in blue. So we're making a measurement, but there's only a, a small portion which is coherent, um, reflections from a smooth enough surface. And from that particular point, we can make the altimetry measurement. So it's only the orange part of those tracks that's being shown below. And again, you can see in those residual plots, which are sort of outlined, these are very small residuals. And so the precision of the measurement is very good. Um, and it approaches the level of typical traditional altimeters. Now, I, I, I wanted to show more um, plots to you, um, but I haven't had a chance to get them approved. Um, so I think if I go to the next plots, I'm, I think we're going to basically have to stop at this point. Um, but what I want to say something about is um, a unique feature of the data sets that we are collecting um, and one that I hope people will look at really quickly. There are many satellites that are in the same orbit plane. Um, they are following each other within just a couple of minutes. So it means that they make the same reflection uh, measurement over the surface shifted by a very small amount of distance. And unfortunately, I can't show the results because I have to get approval for everything that goes out the door these days. But I have a couple of slides that I would have put in that um, show that the high profiles, the relative high profiles that we're measuring from, satel from satellites that, were, that are following each other are identical um, or close to being identical, which means that the satellites themselves can be used, the independent satellites can be used to have independent validation. Um, the, the high profiles match each other. So I don't even have to go out and look for a cryosat or an ISAT2 or some other ice thickness measurement because I know that the profiles are matching between the satellites. Um, so in conclusion, what we're seeing from these data sets and these data sets are um, producing many different uh, measurements um, every day the, um, and, and filling in these maps um, in about a week. Um, I, I, if I could show the spatial, spatial sampling, you would see that these can fill in the, between the altimeters quite a bit. And maybe Jessica's plots will show that as well. I just couldn't show the altimetry results. Um, but what we're hoping is that these altimeter measurements um, can be used to fill in between the traditional altimeters um, as well that um, the corrections that we're making for the different error terms can be improved in the future. But we know that we're already sub 10 centimeter precisions in the measurements where they're coherent. Um, so these data will be available through the NASA program. Um, and there's a paper that we've written in GRL that uh, describes some of the initial results. So I'm gonna um, turn it over to Jessica now to start talking about the classification products that come from these same types of data. Hello. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about the sea ice classification that I've been doing um, with this same data. Um, if I can... There we go. Um, so I'm using the same measurements that um, Dallas was just talking about. Um, it starts off with the level 1B. So there's information about both the phase and the SNR that we get, the level 1B. This is different to traditional GNSSR, um, which you normally get DDMs and you can see it slightly more visually. Um, but here's an example of some of the tracks below. Um, the top plot is the phase and the bottom is the SNR. Um, and the plot on the right is the variable that we take from this. This variable is the standard deviation of the change in phase. Um, it represents how much the phase is changing over a certain window. In this case, it's a one second window. So that's about 50 samples. Um, so that sort of dictates our um, along track resolution. Um, so this is taken from taking the difference in phase for each measurement, and then over that whole window of time, taking the standard deviation. Now, where the surface is roughness, roughness rougher, we would expect um, a slightly more jumpy phase, so be more noise. So we call that um, a high phase noise measurement. And um, where there's less change in phase, um, that should indicate a smooth surface or a more coherent reflection. And so that's down at the, the lower end of the phase noise. Um, so we can see this geographically here. Here's an example. This is the same track, um, but drawn geographically, coming out from the ocean and going in towards Antarctica. Um, the blue on this um, color bar represents the high phase noise, which is the less coherent reflections. Um, so you can see the time where it changes from 
ocean into being an ice reflection. And you can pretty much just sort of draw a line there if you want. Um, it's pretty obvious where the ice edge is. So um, if we plot all of plot lots of tracks, then we can see this is how it looks geographically. And we can see that it's not only the ice edge that we can we can see. There's actually patterns within the ice pack. This data is from March to June of 2020. Um, and there's quite a strong change between the ocean in the blue and the ice in the red. Here's reflectivity, which is another variable that we use to um, classify the surface that we're looking at. This is effectively the ratio between the incident signal and the reflected signal. Um, where a reflection is less coherent, we'd expect to receive less of the reflected signal back at the satellite. And so this would be a low reflectivity. This variable is corrected for things like the range to the surface and the antenna gain and the angle of incidence and all those good things. So how do we apply this to sea ice extent? Now, there's quite a lot of words on this slide, but I'll, um, I'll step through it. Um, so I've pretty much done what I said a second ago and just sort of drawn a line. Um, I've trained the thresholds on only one week in March in 2020. Um, and the data shown in the plots on the left is actually from March all the way through June. Um, and I've trained it using an extreme climatology that I've created from the NSIDC sea ice concentration product. Um, this is sort of 30 plus years of data, and I've um, averaged this on a monthly basis um, using areas that have always been ice um, as ice training areas, with, well, always been ice within that month, and areas that have always been water within that month as the area to train water on. Um, this gives us the flexibility to not be completely tied to one product, um, but still be sure that we are training over areas that represent um, what we think they're representing. So the thresholds on the left, if we take the top um, two plots, we've got the ice and the open water. Now, these are all um, thresholded in elevation angle bins as a signal that comes in at a low elevation angle. Um, we'll be looking at a fairly different surface to one that comes in quite steeply. Um, it'll look a lot rougher from a lower angle. So we've got separate thresholds for each elevation angle bin. And you can see that although the data shown um, has only got one week of the training data in it, um, it all still follows quite nicely with the thresholds. And it delineates the two quite well. And so this gives you some more flashing pictures. Um, sorry, it's a bit whizzy on the eyes. Um, but this is how we get our ice extent. And this is, agrees quite well with a lot of different products, active, passive, and um, operational products too. So ones that people have actually probably come into contact with and actually had a look at before they've sent it out. We wouldn't expect it to necessarily agree to 100% um, because otherwise we wouldn't really be bringing anything new or there wouldn't be any additional information. This way, hopefully we can find out extra stuff about the ice rather than the same old. If we look at this um, on a temporal scale, um, the training period is on the left, the dotty line um, to show where that where that ends. Um, and this is in the Antarctic. So we're going from summer on the left into winter on the right. The blue is where we've got it right. And the dark blue is the water and the light blue is the ice. So we can see that's increasing. It's all as we'd hoped. The red is where we've not got it quite so right, or at least where we don't agree with the truth products. Um, here's the Arctic. You can see the opposite pattern in terms of ice cover. And unfortunately, a bit of an increase in error as well. Um, this is expected going into summer, especially as um, the tr conditions that we trained in at the very start of March won't be much like the conditions on the ice surface in May. Um, in order to uh, mitigate this, we're hoping to possibly do a dynamic training, so train on one week, apply for the next, um, or something like that. Um, in this case, the training on the climatologies will really come into its own because we won't be so worried about tying ourselves to another product or um, being too overfitted. So um, the natural step after this is the sea, the sea ice type. On the left, we've got our phase noise variable um, that I described earlier. Um, and on the right, we've got an OSSIF ice type product. And you can see that just sort of from eyeing it up, that the spatial patterns are fairly similar. You can see the multi-year ice above Greenland and um, going up into the first year ice. 
Um, so in order to classify this, I've done pretty much the same thing again, just with an ice type product. It's all quite simple so far. And um, I've here gridded it at a five kilometer grid. And you can see that visually it matches fairly well. There are some areas where it doesn't match quite so well. Um, I think this might be down to other factors affecting the roughness of the ice. Um, and on a point by point basis, it um, agrees quite well with not only the active product shown on the screen, but also um, with the weekly ice charts um, from the US National Ice Center. Um, it's also at the same kind of level as previous GNSSR ice type studies. So we can see that we're not um, doing something completely wild, um, but it's over much larger spatial and temporal time scales than those ones. Um, we think that this sea ice pro type product is um, fairly unique in that traditionally now they tend to rely either on multiple frequencies or a lot of human input and expert analysis, um, as with the ice charts. Um, and they tend to have a larger footprint or at least a varying one. One of the good things about this measurement is being measured with only one frequency. Um, we've just sort of got the one footprint over coherent surfaces. We sort of know how big it is. Um, and we're not using a big mix of sources or with their own um, pros and cons. And so if we look at this on a smaller scale to see whether it actually works rather than just broadly waving at maps. Um, I'm not sure how well this will come out on your screen. I'm not sure what the contrast is up to, but on, on mine it's okay. So I'll try and use my mouse, my mouse to point things out. Um, so here's some images of Plinius from Sentinel-1. Um, in the top right of the left-hand court, the left-hand picture, um, you can see there's a pollinia surrounded by ice pack. Um, the ice pack here is shown in red with our tracks overlaid on top, and the pollinia itself has got blue. The blue is for the um, look, the higher phase noise data, so the less coherent data, and this is as we'd expect over pollinias. Um, as quite large bodies of water, they can um, have, they can be rougher. Um, than things like leaves, which we'd expect to be highly coherent. And we can see the same on the right on this pollinia. Um, pollinia is here, and then we've got the red over the ice and the blue over the water. And it's important to know where pollinias are. Um, probably don't need to tell you guys that. Um, so large leaves, um, these are it's very valuable to have a look at, especially if we're considering our um, sea ice altimetry. Um, if we can identify the leads, then it would be good to um, have an idea of where the sea surface is so that we can effectively measure the freeboard of the ice. Um, they show up nice and coherent um, due to their still and flat nature um, in our data. This is a lead shown in the middle here. I've blown it up at the bottom so that hopefully it's a little bit more visible. Um, and not only can you see that there's highly coherent tracks over the lead itself, but um, the little flow in the middle is um, showing up with its own little point, um, a bit less coherent than the lead itself. Um, and this is very promising at the moment because we're using one second of data for our statistical window size. Um, we're limited a little bit in our long track resolution, but we're looking to optimize that. So hopefully that won't be such a, um, such a hurdle. Um, and ice types as well. So on the bottom here, you've got um, some ice chart data and on the right is our Sentinel-1 imagery. Um, so you can obviously see the different ice types quite clearly in the Sentinel-1 imagery, but what is more exciting is that you can see it in our imagery too. So if we take this corner up here, um, we've got this red track that goes in from the new ice, and then it crosses over some first year ice, which will be older than the new ice, and then back into a bit of new ice before going back into the first year ice. And you can really see that transition in our track because we go from red to yellow to blue, back to red, and then off to yellow and blue. There's also this nice ice free area here in the bottom right, which is showing up nice and blue in our tracks. So not coherent at all, less coherent. Um, and if we do a point by point co location, um, then this same data shows up. And this is in the Arctic. This is from the US National Ice um, Service weekly charts flow size on the left and ice type on the right. Um, something really interesting is this bimodal distribution of the youngest ice. Um, now this, I believe, is probably where a lot of our misclassification is coming from. 
um, because the youngest dice seems to be both more coherent and less coherent. Um, I think this is because of the dynamic environment in which the newest dice is often created, which can lead to it being rougher to start with. Thinking of pancake dice. In the Antarctic, these show the same kind of patterns. If we look at the one on the right, sorry, there's quite a lot of lines going on, but the blue ones are all blue and green are all quite young ice. And this orange in the middle is the oldest ice. Um, and so um, these younger ice types are highly bimodal in the Antarctic, pretty much all of them are. You can see that in the Antarctic, we only really expect the younger ice and then a bit of old ice. Um, and this matches up with the more dynamic um, environments of the marginal ice zone. And you can see this in the flow size um, data on the left, um, where there's, it's not even bimodal, it's just low coherence um, in this ice type. So that leads me on to our mystery variable. Um, we call it excess phase noise. Um, if I recap for a minute on how we calculated the phase noise variable, um, it was the standard deviation of the change in phase in a window. Um, so we would expect this to also vary with the amplitude of the signal. That's shown um, at the bottom left here. For instance, if we had a track that was mostly noise, then the um, phase noise wouldn't necessarily make that much sense. So in order to take away the amplitude um, dependent part of the phase noise, um, what we've done is we've used the direct signal um, and we've compared the direct phase noise with the direct amplitude over a large sample of our data. Um, on the left here, you can see that with the red line showing the sort of model that we've taken from this data. And on the right is um, the plot for the reflected signal. So phase noise on the y-axis and amplitude on the x-axis. And effectively, the excess phase noise is simply taking that red line away from each of these points. So it's the difference between the signal that the phase noise that we would receive um, at a certain amplitude and the phase noise that we've actually received. And that gives us patterns like this. Um, so this might look a little bit noisy, but there are some exciting features here. The um, black line that you can see is the ice edge data from OSSIESAF. Um, this is a week's worth of data on our part. So I've put in the start of the week and the end of the week from the OSSIESAF data. Um, <coughs> and you can see this sort of red halo around Antarctica. Um, I believe that this corresponds to the data that we were looking at earlier with the slightly bimodal distribution. Um, and I think it might be indicative of dynamic environments, but um, that's still yet to be seen, um, not confirmed, but very interesting. Um, and Lots of sort of coherence going on here as well. Some interesting patterns over the over the northern hemisphere too. Um, so we've seen that the our measurements can have high spatial resolution, high return rate, high agreement with current products, and um, also provide some extra information that we're possibly not getting anywhere else. Um, the agreement with the ice chart mapping is great because it means that we might be able to help. Um, with that in the future, even in our current format as tracks rather than gridded. Um, but also at the moment, we can grid to a fairly high spatial resolution. So that's bad too. Oh, I think back to Dallas now. Just quickly, um, these are some examples of what I was talking about where two satellites are in the same plane. You can see that on the bottom right. Um, they're following each other. They're about two minutes apart. Um, this is FM 101 and FM 100. They made the, basically the same reflection measurement using uh, data from, um, I don't know exactly which GPS satellite, but I think it was PRN31. And what you see here is that they're basically making the same kind of pro high profile measurement. And that's shown in the middle um, two plots. Um, so you can see that they follow the mean sea surface exact, almost exactly the same um, along that track. Um, there are some differences in the coherence. You can see the dropouts up in the top right plot. You can see where we drop out differently along that track. And then unfortunately, the scale on the plots in the um, middle right plots are not the same. These are quick look plots that are generated via processing. Um, but what you can see is there's correlation between these residuals as well, which means that they're making the same residual measurements. So they're making whatever the ice height is um, relative to the mean sea surface, and they're um, correlated. Now, if you also stare um, at this, you will notice some 
uh, jumps in some of the residuals, maybe about um, second 200 on the right. That's a phase jump, and that's where we are um, doing phase unwrapping on this signal, and we had a, a portion where the, we had a, a phase jump and didn't get corrected properly. Um, so there's a discontinuity. Um, that's one of the things that we do have in these data sets. Um, and then on the bottom left of this plot, you can also see the tropospheric delay correction that's being applied from a model. And you can see that the, the magnitude of that delay correction is very large at low elevation angles um, and decreases as you go up in elevation angle. And that's what I mentioned earlier. Go to the next slide, I think it's a, another example of this type of two satellites following each other. Again, it's FM 101 and FM, 10, um, FM 100. And if you look in those middle, um, plots, you can again see that the height, relative height profile that they're measuring is the same um, from the two different um, reflections, so two completely two different independent data sets. You can also see an example of a phase jump on one of the left plots um, as well in the residual, and you can see that. Um, and then I didn't have a chance to do much of any kind of, of analysis here, but on the bottom right is um, the some SMOS Cryosat 2 uh, thickness data for this particular day. Um, hopefully what we'll be able to do in the future is to actually get that height, same height profile out for this particular track and compare it. Um, another thing you can also see is the um, large um, deviation um, with respect to the mean sea surface in the beginning of the data, about second 50, and that has to do with the magnitude of that tropospheric delay correction. And you can kind of see that in the data sets on the bottom plots. And what I wanted to show here was this, this, these are measurements over a week. And I think Jessica kind of showed this too. Um, and it also shows the data over the ice sheets, which some people might be interested in. And you can see that the measurements of the ice sheets sometimes are coherent as well. So there's a potential for these measurements to make altimetry uh, relative height profiles over the ice sheets as well. Um, and then on the, on the right-hand side, you can see the coherence probability map. Um, as well. And that this is just letting us see what the coherence probability is um, for these particular regions. It's exactly what the phase noise is showing as well. And these are the altimetric retrievals over one week. And so you can see that the altimetric retrievals are uh, mainly you know, in areas where we have coherence. You can see that where there is rough ice, multi-year ice um, above Greenland, you can see that there's a drop in the altimetric retrieval. And um, so these are areas where if we're trying to do altimetric retrievals over multi-year multi -year ice, we're gonna run into some problems. And so these are these are areas of, of, um, of uh, further, further work. So I think that is the last of the slides that I had. We can go back down to the bottom. So we'll just end with uh, showing that we also have these two new satellites um, that are making conventional near nadir incidence um, reflections measurements, and they got launched into polar orbits back in January of this year. Um, and so they also can be used for doing sea ice remote sensing. If you go to the next slide, we'll show you some early results from these satellites. Um, so here is an example of what these satellites are measuring. Um, and this is, a this is an example of the reflectivity value that was coming from these satellites. You can see uh, reflectivity is like a signal-to-noise ratio measurement. Um, you can see that the signal-to-noise ratio from these satellites that's being measured um, and this is just five days of data is showing, um, you know, sensitivity to ice edge as well as obviously ice type um, and roughness. And so we'll be looking at these data as well. Um, you can also see um, these data sets are being collected over land surfaces above 50 degrees as well. And so there's some interesting uh, land and ice sheet reflections coming from these satellites. So I will end with the uh, main point here, which is the quantity of data that can be produced from these satellites is huge. So what you see on the right-hand side is a simulation where we took basically real uh, uh, cubes, uh, real nanosatellite orbits that we have on our constellation and um, assuming that they were being able to produce all of the data that's available to them in terms of the amount of reflections. This is the number of reflections that we would measure in a day um, if they were mapped to a 12 kilometer grid cell. And what you see on the right is some of these areas are measured 40 times a day, um, one 12 kilometer grid point. So the, um, the idea to have these types of cheap measurements that are really plentiful and that you can beat down the noise through um, multiple measurements is now come to fruition with this type of system. Um, we're talking about just 20 nanosatellites um, are simulated here. But remember what I said is that we have over 40 nanosatellites and um, there are currently 19 that are operating 
Um, and we are currently doing just GPS reflections, but in the next couple of months, we will be adding uh, reflections from all of the constellations as well. And I'll end as well by saying that these data are available for, to uh, through the NASA Commercial Satellite Data Acquisition Program, which is now available to all US government affiliated and funded researchers. So for all intents and purposes, I think that's everybody in the US. Um, and then as well through the ESA EarthNet program. Um, and I think um, we will um, stop there and uh, take any questions.